All right, guys. So this is Alex from Riffin Rock Music Talk, and I have a wonderful special guest here today. You probably know him as number one on our five bases to listen to for inspiration. I am talking to the man, the myth, potentially a legend, but we've seen him in the wild. This is Juan Alderete from Big Sur, Deltron 3000, Vato Negro. The list goes on. Juan, thanks so much for talking to Riffin Rock. Thank you. And it's actually Deltron 3030, not 3000. Oh, shit. Street cred lost. Hey, all good. <laughs> you know, it was, it's weird because there's a Dr. Octagon song called 3000. And so I, you know, like I work with, I've worked, I worked with the automator on that and I work out with them on Deltron. And so it's like, you know, 3000. And then there's Deltron 3030, you know, 3030. And so I was just like, I don't know what you deal with the year 3000, <laughs> but, or in that decade or whatever, but I mean, century, but anyways, Long story short, no worries, no worries, all good. <laughs> Great. So, um, one thing I want to start off with is you just recently put out a new Big Sur album, uh, Digital Gardens. Yes, which obviously sounds similar to the last album's title, which was called Before Gardens, After Gardens. And basically, you know, like Lisa and I like knew it takes us a while to do records. Yep, and yep. Primarily because we've paid for every record that we've done in our careers. We've never had a record label give us money. Um, so, so it takes a long time. Like people always wonder like, oh, they must not be that prolific. I mean, we write all the time and make tons of records if we had money, but we don't. So the first record, you know, then there was a big giant gap and then we released a remix record. Yeah, yep. And then the second record, I mean, the third record we did and, and, and we knocked that one out pretty easily. And I think it's just because we had a lot of material and then it took us a long time to get to before guards out there. So we, you know, we're like, Oh, well, should we do a remix record again? Like are, do people even do those? I don't really think they do. They do remixes of singles, but so we just said, well, like, why don't we just redo? I was really my idea. Like I was like, why don't we just redo the entire record in a, in a digital hardcore fashion? And the only reason that is, is because I, I, I was a giant fan of Atari teenage, Riot. I always <laughs> loved them. I always thought that, that was a band that was, I mean, they, they were, they, people did find them and they got it, but like, I just figured in this electronic world that runs festivals and runs the music industry right now, like I just figured people would have gone back to them because I, I personally don't find a lot of punk rockness in today's electronic music. I mean, I, I'm sure it's there in the DIY kind of like, you know, mindset is definitely cool. Sure. I mean, dudes are making their own records, putting them all out themselves, booking their own tours. Like it's all, you know, I understand that, but the sound of the record, it's, it's, it's they, they all sound the same, whatever. I mean, Atari Teenage, right. Nobody sounded like them. It was fucking distorted. It was, it was abrasive. You know, it was dissonant. And, and those are all things that I always associated sonically to punk rock music. And I, I don't, I mean, you know, I know there's artists out there doing it, but never with the ferociousness of Atari Teenage Riot. So I just figured that somebody would like, ban you know, like everything comes back around. Drum and bass is around right now. Jungle people are, you know, doing jungle again. So I just figured they would go to this and nobody ha that I know of really has. And so I was like, fuck it, let's do it. And so, and I know that I've played with Lisa for so many years and I know she has an awesome screaming voice. And we've never, I mean, we, we have a track literally like on every album where she does a little screaming, but she typically doesn't, you know, go to that as her first vocal approach. Yeah, yeah. So I said, no, I want, I want this whole record with you just screaming, just because I just think it's such an insane sound, and I just think people would dig it. So I, I just beefed up the BPMs on it, on the songs that we did, and I just wanted it to be lean. So I just wanted it to be my bass primarily, and and drums or drum loops or whatever, and um, that's how we did it. And so that's the digital garden is basically, you know, the four gardens after gardens done in a digital hardcore fashion. It's almost like except for the last, except for the last song. It's almost so. like I, cause I listened to it about last week or so. And, um, hopefully it sounds appropriate when I was like, I was listening to it. I'm cracking up because you know, your other albums are very melodic. They're very passionate, you know, a little more down tempo. Um, but all of a sudden I've turned yes. this on and it's like, kind of like you mentioned, it's almost like digital electronic punk music. And I'm like, holy shit, I have never heard big, I mean, I've heard you like you and previous bands doing that aggressive sound, but just Lisa doing that really aggressive voice, that, that snare just going like mad. I'm like, oh my God, this is just cracking me up. It, it was like, 
it's a remix album, kind of like you said, but in a totally, in a sort of a different way, because, you know, like you said, uh, it's not just like, well, we're going to remix it, chop it up, make it all, inter- you know, a little bit different. It's, you know, we're just reapproaching all these songs in this really mean, visceral way. Yeah, and, and, and also, like, you know, when you do remix records, man, it takes forever to get these guys to return you the tracks, and it just wasn't like, I was like, you know, like, who are we going to hit, and who's going to be, a, you know, like, who's going to meet the deadlines and stuff. Like, it just seemed like a headache. And I was like, well, I, I, you know, like, obviously everybody has to be able to do stuff out of the computer. And I'm not great at it, but, like, I, I'm going to figure it out. And it's just going to sound good to, to Lisa and me. And so, you know, we we threw it together. And, and, and really, I mean, you know, when Pat, when Lisa and I were in the band Pat, you know, we had a lot of really crazy songs where she was screaming and, you know, and it, it, you know, people don't really like, I, I think when we've done shows, people look at her and they go, what is going on here? It's just <laughs> like, they just, they don't get it. Like they don't understand why she's doing this, but it's like, she's an artist, man. Like she can sing beautifully, passionately, softly, and she can scream. And, and I mean, my, I always know I'm in trouble with her when she screams on the phone at me. Like, I'm just like, it just sounds like, I mean, nothing <laughs> scares me more. She's just got this, like, I, I, there's this old little character. Most people won't know this reference, but there was this old cartoon character called Baboom. And Baboom used to scream, like, with his voice, and he could break down buildings and break down, like, giant rocks or, you know, he, that's how he, that was his superpower. And I used to call Lisa Baboom when I first met her. I'm like, you're Baboom, man. Like her voice is just all, ah, and then it just <laughs> shit crumbles. So anyway, like we, you know, and, and I did want to do some live tracks and we had actually, Lisa and I had done a show with Dave Elish yep. um, last year and, you know, we wanted to try this. And, and so we had such fun and I just thought it went really well. So we were like, well, let's get Dave to do the live tracks on this. So we went in the studio with Dave for one day, like half a day, really. Then we cut everything live right there in the spot. It's all one take. Uh-huh. I did a couple of overdubs, just a double bass parts or something. But but you know, I know at least two of those tracks were completely live, including Lisa's vocals. And so, you know, it's 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 just we you know we wanted to keep it raw. We wanted to keep it punk, and we wanted to just like kind of show kids like. I know kids, every, you know, the kids, when I meet kids, it's because everybody's younger than me, but <laughs> I know people are, how they're making records or whatever, but like, you know, this, this is how Lisa and I grew up making records was just, you know, you do it in one day and that's all the money you had. And I know that this guy's still going to studios, but most people are on their laptops, so they have all day long to make their records, you know, and, uh, like years or whatever long they want to take. But when you pay for the studio and you're going in and you're like, you got to knock it out. I don't think, I, mean, I, yeah, I guess Dave, we did rehearse once with Dave, so that's kind of like one rehearsal, went in the studio, played him, and knocked it out. So this is kind of like, uh, and with the with the creation of record, I'm hearing that it sounds like it was also like a old school approach of creating the record, where you know it's not just sitting on laptops and MacBooks, slowly crafting it. Is you know we went and we banged it out, and we ran out of money, so we got to go. Right, right. I mean, that's just the whole thing. We wanted to meet a time frame because because our next record's going to take a lot longer to make uh-huh. just because of of the style that we're going to go for like it's like you know like Big Sur doesn't we don't we don't have a big fan base we don't make money doing what we do this is Lisa's and my passion project or art project and so we literally I mean we were in, we definitely shoot ourselves in the foot but that's just cuz we're trying to be you know pleasing to each other like when our german album name that I can't even pronounce that we called the <laughs> three, two records ago, whatever. Like, you know, that was just because I put it, I put our demos in iTunes and it labeled it this. And so we were like, fuck, I guess that's what we're calling the record. And we <laughs> called it that. And so, you know what I mean? Like it's just stupid shit like that. You know, like the very first record we, it, it intros with this gangbanger kid that we knew. And he was like in the studio, like he wanted to be a rapper, but he had no rhythm or timing. And so he made this rap and we found it. And we were like, whoa, this is a gem. Like this guy, you can just tell like he wants to be a rapper. He wants to have flow. He wants to have rhythm and be in time, but he isn't. And he's horrible, <laughs> but he's cute and it's endearing. And so, so that starts off our first record. So, you know, just, you know, she shoot yourself in the foot because like most people aren't going to get it. 
most people, it goes right over their heads. I mean, Ocho Motley, they loved it. I know when we, when we, when those dudes got the record, every time I see one of those dudes there, I go, Oh, big sir, speedy lament. You know, that's <laughs> what they know our record for because of that dumb intro. But most people don't get us, you know, like it just goes. Anyway, I think this record's going over people's heads because I've had a lot of kids going, why did you do this? It doesn't sound like big sir. I prefer the old sound. We're not changing our sound. We just tried something like, I just, man, like, does, does anybody do anything that's not unscripted? I mean, I know there are, but, like, fuck, I mean, I think most artists, no. I mean, I guess, I guess like, Arcade Fire did a record that nobody expected that doesn't sound like any other Arcade Fire record, and, you know, props to them. But, like, I, you know, no. we just, we just, like, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you say we don't care, but, I mean, it almost reminds me of, not to name drop your previous band, but Mars Volta, where no matter which album you put on, you got pretty much hit in the face with something completely different. And so I, you know, I I had saw, I think, like a clip on YouTube of the show with Dave Elitch where, and I'm like, holy shit, what's going on here? Then all of a sudden, I, uh, you had like, you put the teasers on YouTube for the album coming out, and I was loving it because I'm hearing like something so off the beaten path, and you know, for a band just to go, I mean, no matter how big or small the band is to go, here's something that's completely the opposite of everything we've done, like it or leave it. But for you guys to do that, I think deserves a lot of credit because there's obviously the very safe option of just going, hey, we're going to put out the same thing. We know it's going to hit this many people because that's how many people were there last time. But no, we're going to take a risk and we're going to do something dynamic and different. Yeah, and, 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 and like, you know, someone like Kid Koala, I gave his Erica. That's Kid Koala, but okay. I gave Eric a copy of um, of the record before it came out. And, you know, like, you give your record out to people, like your friends and stuff, and mostly even your friends won't even listen to it. Like, <laughs> I, I gave it I gave it to everybody in Zavala's, and nobody commented on it. So I'm oh, pretty no. sure that none of, those, none of those guys listened to it. I mean, that's fine. I don't care. Like, you know, I don't know all their catalog of music either, you know? So, and, and, and but I gave it to Koala, not really expecting it. And, like, next time I saw him, he's like, dude, that record's awesome. I'm telling you, man, it, you got it. You got to, you know, you got to do something with it. And I was like, yeah, that's what I think. You know, like, <laughs> you know, I got excited, you know, cause like, that's what I think. I really think it's one of the best things I've ever been a part of. Like it's, it's exactly what I wanted to say, exactly how I wanted to say it. And I think that nobody can compete with Lisa. I mean, I, now I'm just like my, just like my pride is coming out through it. But like, I literally don't think anybody can fuck with Lisa when she starts screaming like that. Nobody can. She's the most terrifying girl on the mic when she does that shit. She's just, I've always thought that. Like when the, you know, the first time I played with her and she screamed, I was like, what the fuck? And you know, like, it just, it, it's like a stun gun. You're just like, you, you're, you're not supposed to have that voice. You know, like, Courtney Love, yeah, she's supposed to be screaming and she just looks like a fucking mess. But Lisa is like, you know, scrawny girl with MS. And so, you know, like, and she can still scream her ass off, you know? Well, that was, I think it was from your first album. You had the song, uh, I think it was Pistol Chaser, where she kind of gets into that a little bit. I don't know, right? The first time I listened yeah, to that album. Yeah, right, totally. I, yeah, and the first time I listened to, like, every other song, you know, pretty, pretty, she's pretty chill sounding. And also, she just starts going off. And I'm like, oh my God, that's just, that's crazy. But it's awesome. The fact that she can pull off both sides of the spectrum, I think, is just astounding and phenomenal. Oh, yeah, yeah, awesome. And by the way, I didn't mean to say scrawny. I meant to say skinny. Skinny. Scrawny is a different word. We'll, we'll dub it over. We'll dub it over. Actually, yeah, she's actually really tall. So, <laughs> like, she can't be scrawny. Um, but anyway, but yeah, and, and, and so, like I said, like, I, I really believe in it. I, I mean, the hard part is, too, is, like, we both have put ourselves in a corner because we don't know how we're going to perform next month in our European tour. We don't know how we're going to pull this off. Oh, really? Like, yeah, do we like open up with the hardcore and then go into Melanist? Do we go start with Melanist and go into hardcore? Do we even do the hardcore at all? Or do we even do mellow? Sh- I mean, we know we don't know yet. Like we're just like, fuck, what should we do? And our shows are always like as mellow as we are, we probably even live, we should probably be a little bit darker or maybe more like Portis head or something, but but we don't we we're not. We're like goose and we lo- love hip hop and so we're always like just shouting out hip hop phrases and just being dumb, you know, because that's <laughs> literally why Lisa and I even came together so tightly because we both loved hip hop so much. You know, she, she actually had a, a, a band like before I met her where they did an acoustic version of gin and juice. It was like a girl <laughs> band. And they did an acoustic version of gin and juice. It was an acoustic version. 
And it was always on KXLU, like, you know, College Station here in Los Angeles. They always, all every year, every kid would play it because it's just these acoustic you know, singing girls, you know, doing lay back. I got your mind on your money. You know, it's just, it's just funny. And so, like, I, I thought I was ill when I met her. I go, you're that girl? Because I had heard that track before I met her. I'm like, that's dope. I go, I love that. And then we just have a love for hip hop. So when we play, like we've actually performed in, you know, like Adidas jumpsuits and gold chains just because we're stupid asses. And again, like you just never know what you're going to get with us. But like, I, I do feel like our music is probably more along the lines of Portishead than it is, than it is, you know, any real hip hop artist or, or Atari Teenage Drive for that fact. I think anyone, that, I, mean. I think anyone who's going to listen to this is going to agree with me when we, when I say we need to hear this recording. Ah, uh, dope, dope. I mean, I, bonus, you, you bonus no track idea, for like, buying for buying the album, whatever it is. We need to hear Lisa's acu- <laughs> the the acoustic gin and juice. Right. Oh, that word, that too. I mean, you know, she she she. she I mean, she's just so versatile. I, you know, man, she's just she's just my girl. Like I, I love Lisa to death. You know, and I, I will say this that I love Pet too. We had, we made some really great music together. I mean, I joined after their initial record, but. You know, I toured that whole record, and then we made another record. And it just, it's just, you know, it's just awesome to to have found your, your, you know, the person that doesn't. I don't know. Like, I'll have an idea, and I was because she's gonna, you know, nobody's gonna be into this, and then she's always into it. She's always <laughs> like, yeah, that's awesome. I'm like, dope. I mean, artwork, I always let her do, and I've never ever been disappointed. Everything she does with the artwork, I love. So she does all the I cover absolutely art. Absolutely love. I mean, she, she finds it. Like, she doesn't make it. Like, she found the Digital Gardens artwork. Um, Rob Sato or Sato, I, I don't know how you say it there, but he's the, she, she's friends with him or something. She goes, she just sent it. She goes, this is Digital Gardens. And she sent me, and I'm like, fuck, you have a genius. <laughs> you know, and, and the same thing with, like, the first Big Sur record. That's, a, that's, like, the first digital photo, and it's actually of, the area Big Sur. Oh, really? And so if you look at it, if you look at it, it's a pixelated, weird photo, but it was the first photo ever, you know, or the first series of photos ever taken digitally. Wow. And it's of Big Sur, but S-U-R, yep, and then yep. that's our album cover. She found that. She got the okay for it and everything for us to use it. And I was like, man, that's so tight. And then she shot the photo for the second remix record, and then the third record was a really close artist friend of hers, and she showed it to me, and I'm like, dope. I love it. I mean, you know, it's just one of those things, like, I, I, I easily, gladly give her the power of, of the art <laughs> department for our, our band. Awesome. And so you guys are going to be touring Europe for about a, a month or so, or a couple weeks? No, it's a couple weeks, because, you know, like I, what I tried to do is put it around the Deltron thing we're doing, so it's like, you know, so that way Deltron pays for some of my ticket out there because <laughs> you, know I mean? you kind of got to do stuff like that. And so, uh, so yeah, we, we, we were flying out on the 12th and then we go of June and then we, we go to um, Italy. And for some reason, you know, I guess it's because our booker is Italian, so she could get us these shows. And Lisa actually has a following there too. So, so we go into Italy and we, we did it uh, two years ago in 2012 and so we're kind of some of the same cities but a couple other different cities but it's it's just awesome because you, you're in italy so yeah, yeah. it's literally a paid vaca- vacation and it's this time of year which makes it just even it's just going to be awesome and we get to play well one i think is there a couple of them are festivals so oh, really i don't know it's just gonna yeah so it's just going to be awesome for us like we never get to do stuff like this and it's just her and me and and the and the ipad we're not going to bring a drug. We just don't have the money for it. There's sure. no money for sure. this. And then uh, we're doing some stuff in Portugal, and then we end up in the UK, which is even though the like when you get the when you get the all the paperwork from the UK, and it's like, oh, you're playing shows. It's um, this kind of money, and you're like, oh yeah, that's going to be cool. But then you forget when you're there that everything's twice oh, as much. Oh, it's so expensive you know, over there. More, yeah, and so you're just like, oh. But you kind of got to just know that you're going to eat at the venue and then go to the grocery store. You're not eating at restaurants. You're yeah, not like, yeah. it, it, it's not like the Mars Volta days where like, you know, we end up at the bars at night or whatever. It, it, like That's like a totally different world compared to what I do with Lisa. You know, sure. We just like, we, we, we tough it out. But anyway, yeah. So then, and then, and then like literally we play Thursday night in London. Um, 
and then uh, I think the I think the date on that. Let me look real fast. I think this uh, we played London on the 26th of June, and then I played Glastonbury with Deltron the next day. Oh, good, good. So so, and then I start that tour. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that I'm wondering is why the World Big Sur won't tour the U.S. And there's no money. I mean, like we did a we did a West Coast run, which is our home base. Yeah. We went up to Seattle, and man, we you know like I mean, we 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 didn't lose money, but I mean you know like I'll just give you an example. Sure, it's, it's, it's it happened a lot. It doesn't happen anymore, but it used to happen to us, and I think it also happened to a couple of other members of Mars Volta that weren't the two main guys. But um, we, you know, like we got to this venue in San Francisco. I think it's called the Brick and Mortar. And as soon as we got there, I looked at Lisa and I go. Cause I could tell her, I go, man, I, I don't know. I think that place is too big. And then she, you know, she's like, no, it'll be fine. And we get there and I'm we're loading in. I'm like, we're never, ever going to do good out here. This is, this is, nobody's going to be here. I just know it. And so sure enough, like it's like, fits like 800 people or whatever big it is, maybe 500 people. But there was like 50 people. There. Oh no. And, and 10 of them were family members. So <laughs> mine. So, so you know what I mean? Like you, yeah, just, yeah. you just know, like it just, it's just, you know, there's like, I know there's people who love Big Sur, few dudes here or there, like, and they always write to me, why don't you come here and here? Because like, you're going to be the only dude who's going to roll out. Uh, you know what I mean? L.A. is about the only place where I think we could probably do a couple hundred people. And, and, and even that we don't maintain, so who knows. But like Seattle played in front of like 30 people. Uh, Portland, we did better. We definitely played in front of more people. That was cool. But, you know, who knows? Maybe that's – who knows why that is? It, but I, again, the last show was in Sacramento, and I told Lisa we should cancel that show. Nobody's going to show up, and she's like, "Nah, I think we could. I think it's you know." Last time I played there, there was a good amount of people. We played in front of five people. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, "I told you, I just know this stuff." You know what I mean? I'm not trying to be negative. I just know, I know what comes with it. Because people think these these agents think that, oh yeah, man, it's like. It's, uh, you know, it's some guy in Mars Volta. That means that Mars Volta fans, and they, no, man, they, they're not. They're, they, you know, I, I toured with Cedric last year and in, in our solo band that we did last year and we played Santa Barbara in front of like, I don't know, a hundred people. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just not, it's not what you think. And, you know, granted that tour that we did with Cedric wasn't promoted right and all that and, we kind of just threw it together because we wanted to play the songs out live. So it wasn't a big thing. And then by the end of the tour, the last three shows were sold out. So, you know what I mean? Like people started to hear about it. Yeah. Or whatever, but you can't just put a band's name on a flyer and expect people to roll out. It doesn't work that way. And you can blast social media as hard as you want, but that just, that doesn't mean anything. Like, you know, like there has to be something there. And that's why I really think again, like coming back to digital guard is like, I just think that, like, I think it's shocking. And I think if anything, like, there's going to be somebody who's going to come to me and go, I don't really like any of your other records. I like this record. You know, it might be a kid who's, who's you know, who's, 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 I don't know, like, is some punk-ass kid or something <laughs> who's, like, into that kind of music. But, but he's, he, you know, or he or she is going to be into that record only. But, like, I, I just, we just needed to do something that really let people know that, like, one, we have a lot of energy and and anger towards what's happened to, you know, to us personally. And so just kind of a way to just like let off the steam almost, you know what I mean? Cause it's tough, man. It's a, it's a tough business and, and it's, it's tough too when it's, it's just two of you. And then one of you is, is got a debilitating disease. That's, that's not, no, it's not fair on you. And so, you know, Lisa and I, you know, I just think it's a, I just think it's a powerful statement. I mean, I just wish, I wish there was a way, like we even tried to get a publicist and we wrote to a few publicists and we couldn't get anybody to, 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 to do publicity for it. Like, you know, here you called me up out of, you know, to get an interview. I'm like, of course I'll do it because <laughs> I, you know, it's just me here doing it and Lisa's doing it and that's it. We don't have any, we don't have a team, so to speak. Sure, you know? sure. And it doesn't sound like, uh, like it's, ever been like picked up on it like, i don't remember are you guys on a label like big star on a label is it all just independent releases i i'm blanking no uh, no we, we we were um we were on um was a neurotic yell we, no 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 we were on um we, our first record was on a label and um and actually the owner of that label was like 
an, an insane, super high executive for YouTube or something. <laughs> and, and now, but he doesn't have a label anymore. And then, of course, we were on GSL. And then we were on Sergeant House for uh, the, the last record. Okay, okay. And then we released this record on our own. We, you know, we tried, we sent it out to a few labels and we got really nice comments, but, but nobody wanted to take a go at it because a lot of it too was like, this is just a, you know, you're redoing songs. I'm like, come on, man. It doesn't even sound like the same record. Right. But I, having said that though, I, we do, we are, hopefully this will happen, but we have, we have some, uh, I don't want to jinx it, but I guess I am. And I, rarely care about jinxing stuff but <laughs> but we have a we have a friend who's actually who's helping us you know get it released in japan so so i mean japan like i mean you can you can i mean i think atari teenage riot would be done and over if it wasn't for japan you know they're still huge there and I mean, I, i'm sure they still do well in europe but they're huge in japan and so you know who knows maybe we'll we'll be able to get a life over there and and, and be able to continue to do this well it sounds like you've resolved your own issue you just need to call atari teenage ryan and just open for them with the digital garden set uh, well actually the the guy who's helping us is, is a japanese you know he's, he's over there in japan and he's he's actually talking to alec because alec who, who is alec empire who is uh atari teenage right he um he, I guess he has a label and he has distribution in Japan. So I think that somehow it's going to work out okay. like that. Good. So we'll see. We'll see. You know, he might take insult to it and say, wow, you guys are trying to sound like it, but we're not. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, he, 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 all his stuff is sample and keyboard bass driven. This is a little bit of keyboard, but it's real bass. Some of it's real drums. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's not entirely like it. It's just more of the energy. You know what I mean? And I really, I think. So after the uh, Big Sur tour and the Deltron 3030 tour, what's what's uh, we'll be moving into fall? What's Juan's plan once you get af- get home from these tours? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different world these days, man. Like you know, Deltron luckily has, has been keeping me afloat, and I love doing it, man. I really, really, really love it. I mean, it's like it's a it's so awesome to be around, uh, you know, like dudes who are are. I mean, just, just so different musicians than what I'm used to being around, you know, that, you know, Koala is just unbelievable. He just, he's an amazing musician, amazing turntables, has amazing taste, insanely great guy. Automator is just like, he's a great producer. He's a great musician. You know, Alex, the drummer is also like a, like an engineer producer guy. And he's the drummer. He's just, you know, he's, he's got skills. Taka, the guitar player is awesome. Awesome guitar player, great drummer, but great guitar player has tons of great gear. It's just, it's just awesome being in the semi. Del, Del, like Del, man, like like just being on stage with Del, like it's like has that same energy as like any member that I ever played with in Mark Volk. It's like he he hits things live that just fire you up, and then you next thing you know, you're like you you have as much energy and intensity, and you're throwing out as much as he is. He just runs it. Dell runs the shit. You know what yeah. I mean? He he is absolutely the full energy of that group. And so just being like on stage with that is just man, dude, it's like being a kid again in your first band. So that's awesome. But of course the record, you know, the touring cycle is I don't know. I don't know where it's at, but if we, we have some stuff in November, I think, right. that we're doing. But but um but not a it's not a ton of touring in that. And and the automator also has another project that he's doing with Elizabeth Mary Winstead. She's an actress, but they did this uh, record called got a girl. That's the name of the group. And I'm supposed to be part in that. And so I, they just haven't, they haven't worked out how they're going to tour it. You know, she's obviously a busy actress, so I'm not really sure what they're going to do with that. So um, hopefully I'll do that. Uh, You know, but we'll see. We'll see. Other than that, like, you know, I'm going to be working on the new big Sur record, meaning the real big new big Sur record. (laughs) And then um, I'm working on the Boston Negro record, which I've been telling people I'm going to be putting out forever, and it's still not out. I did this other record that's completed, and we need to get it mixed. But again, and like I could have had it out over a year ago, but since there's no money and we're doing it, paying for it all ourselves, it takes forever to get it done. Sure. So it's still not mixed. And that's with my friend Sugar, who plays guitar in Buffalo Daughter, and an unbelievable drummer, Mark Juliana, who's just awesome drummer and it's a three piece thing instrumental and 
you know, so it's just like, you know, stuff in the pipeline, but again, it's all stuff that, you know, it's, a, it, I got to try to find people to put it out. And if not, it, you know, put it out myself, you know what I mean? You got to pay the bills in the meantime. Yeah. And then in the meantime, like I, I put myself out there, you know, like I, I, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, there'll be another situation that, you know, cause you know, like the way it is, is like, if you're not touring, you're not making loot. And my friend, Jonathan Hishke, and I always talk, it's like right now, bass, or, bass players are the first guys getting eliminated in situations because they're just either having Ableton dudes do it, you know, the bass parts or it's synth bass. It's just like, you know, he was in Broken Bell last tour, this tour, then I'm a bass player. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it's, uh, it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's tough out there, but then it's also really tough on bass players. So, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's just time to just reinvent. You got to just, you know, whatever time, when times change. I mean, I started in stupid speed metal back in the eighties, <laughs> not stupid, but like, you know what I mean? It was like hair slash speed. Cause you know, we, even though we were speed metal, like we had big hair. So, but anyway, but you know, I started in that and then I flipped it and I flipped it and I flipped it just because, you know, it took a while to find out what I really wanted to do. And then, you know, now it's like being able to survive being a musician touring, you know, like I love Deltron because I love hip hop. I wish I could do more hip hop, but hip hop doesn't always pay. Sure. So, you know what I mean? Like, so we're not going to hear, you know, a, we'll we're not going to hear a Juan solo hip hop record. So that would be awesome. But, uh, you know, and again, that's production and I don't really produce. I like, I love the music and I love the genre and I know it's good, but, you know, I did do a little bit of recording with this with uh, rapper John Wayne. I don't know what what'll ever come of it, but like I love his production. I love him as an artist, and and so it would be dope if that came out. And I would work with him at any time he ever. Whenever he says, "Hey, yo, you want to work?" I always go, "Yep, let's do it." Sure, sure. And just that that dude is just he's so fast. Like he sees the vision instantly. It's unbelievable. Like he's just like. From from sound one, he goes, okay, boom, 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 track's done, and he's like, fuck, you know, like, <laughs> like he's that he's that good, he's that he really, really is the real deal. Mm-hmm. And he'll he'll be a guy that um, people will be talking about five years is like, oh yeah, J- John Wayne, one of the biggest producers and you know whatever artists in in hip hop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want to take a step back. Uh, you mentioned uh, sure. the, v- the Vato Negro record. Is that the uh... Is that the trio album you had done with Omar and D'Antoni, or is this a different album? Yeah, it's a different album, just because I don't even know what happened to all that stuff. Oh, no. Um, Was that actually studio recorded, yeah. by the way? Because I, we all yeah, we all heard yeah, it live we, over and over, and um, some people I've talked to, we just sit there like, oh, this these tracks are so good, they're so tight, and just like all these cool jams that you put together, and then like it just never came out. And then you actually, right. and then you leaked out some of the the stuff from I think it was Fuji Rock from like 2010 or 12, and we're like, oh okay, we, we at least have some better uh, yeah. stuff because like some of those songs we only gotten like on bootleg, so we're like, some of us are drooling for that material. Yeah, I, I think it's like, like, like you know, because when I mean, you play Fuji Rock, like you know, Japan, so it's like insanely efficient. And I literally was walking off stage, and this guy comes up and he goes, "Here you go," <laughs> you know. And I'm like literally like walking downstairs to go walk off the stage and he handed it to me. And I was like, fuck. And it was the DVD of the performance. Holy I was shit. like, oh, awesome. And so I, 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 um, I, at the time we were on Sergeant House, I gave it to Kathy and, you know, I don't know. They were like, oh yeah, we might use it for promo or something. And then we never ended up putting out the record. And, you know, I have a copy of it. It's not as good as the copy that I handed over, but that's why I put up that other clip, you know, it's like, I could put up the whole thing, but like, I don't know if that's fair to the other guys, you know? So, so I, I just, I'm not gonna, I just put up the clips that I wrote. Like I wrote, you know, like it was a collective, like I, it started with me and then we were going to do, we were actually going to just, I was going to go to Japan, do Fuji rock with just me and D'Antoni. And we were going to ape the first record. And then Omar's like, well, fuck, I'll go with you. And I was like, Oh, awesome. And so we ended up getting more money, which was nice. And then we were just kind of go freestyle it. And then John Theodore was just about that time doing one day as a lion shows. And he goes, Hey, do you guys want to open up? I'm like, fuck yeah. So I told Omar, we're going to open up. And he's like, <laughs> oh, okay. And then Omar, like, like literally like the day or two days or the week of, I don't remember. Omar's like, 
we can't open up for him. I'm like, why? Because we need to flip this. We can't do it this way. Let's let's go into the studio and write songs and not open up for him. And I was like, all right. So I, uh, I you were gonna open up for I, One I, Day's I, a Lion? Yeah. So what? we canceled uh. out of those shows. We canceled out those shows, and then we went into the studio and and you know a couple afternoons in a Pasadena rehearsal place. D and Omar and I wrote like. Most of that material. I had one that we would, I already, already had with D. And then we wrote one together. Omar wrote one. D wrote one. I wrote one. And then we wrote another one collectively together. And that was that, you know, that was Vato Negro. And that's what we did at Fuji Rock. And then that's, we played, I think we played one of Omar's. No, not on the Fuji Rock. We, we, what ended up happening is like it kind of all of a sudden morphed into Omar's solo thing. Yeah, yeah. And so then, so then we would do, we would be at an Omar solo show, but we'd be playing Bato Negro songs. And so, I don't know, it just kind of got all really kind of confusing and weird, meaning like not really sure who owned what anymore. Okay. But long story short, like, you know, the, the Fuji Rock was the most pure thing. And literally that, like, one day as a lion was one of the headliners of that Fuji Rock. And, and so, you know, like, we've always, all of us have always been really good friends. Um, and I think that, you know, John was just super cool, wanted to help us out because, you know, we, you know, we're Omar and Omar and I always had a bunch of things that we were doing, you know, like whether it was his solo stuff or whatever, we were always, you know, he's such a workaholic that, you know, and I just always made sure I played bass on everything he did. So have you talked to him at all since the, the band split? Um, I, I had checked him once on his birthday and that's the last contact I've had with him. I, you know, it's, it's just, it's got, not like complicated. It, and I don't really, in a situation like this, I don't think it's fair to talk about it because sure, sure. I think that, I think it would be fair if he was talking about it at the same time I was but like, yeah, I, w- I, you know, I, I wish things were different, but I, you know, I, you know, I, I wish him and Cedric all the luck. I mean, they, they don't need my, they don't need luck or luck, wish, wish luck or whatever. I mean, they'll be fine. Those guys will always do really well, but you know, I just, you know, I just think that it, when, when you work as hard at something as Omar and I did on, on Mars Volta, it takes its toll, it takes its toll on a lot of things. And it, and it, and you know, I'm, I, I can definitely say that I, 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 ha- I needed a break from a lot of things, you know, at that point I, I was, I was so stressed out, you know, and I can't really afford to be stressed out because, you know, like I, I'm a healthy guy, but I, I, I have health issues. And when you're not in a good place, your health issues get, you know, compromised. And so, so I just know that I, I feel better because I don't have that stress anymore. And, you know, because when you're trying to, I mean, it really breaks down to like when you're trying to be the biggest band in the world and it's not happening, that's going to, that's going to break your heart. Yeah, and yeah. it's also going to break, it's going to break friendship. It's going to break relationship. It's going to break a ton of things. And I literally was absolutely believed that, that the Mars Volta was going to be the biggest band in the world. I did. Omar did, you know, I think Cedric did, you know, everybody, a part of it at one point when they were in it, believed that, well, we're going to be the biggest band. Cause, you know, you just, when you go to play festivals, everybody's watching you and going, fuck, what is this? <laughs> you, nobody sounds like you do. And, you know, so you believe it, but then, you know, like, it's just, it's just not, it's not as easy as, or I shouldn't say, it's just not just going out and throwing out music. There's all this other stuff that goes with making your band the biggest band in the world. And, and it it all has to fall together as well as luck. And, you know, I'm just, I, 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 I I stand by my 10 years in that band. You know what I mean? Sure. It's, 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 it's unbelievable that I got that chance to do it. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you mentioned this 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 hope for being the biggest band in the world, and I number one, I think that's fantastic that you guys were just you had that ambition and drive just to be like, you know what, this is this is our goal, this is our outlook. We're gonna just we're gonna be the biggest thing, and I mean definitely for what it's worth, um, you know when you were joining the band when the band was starting to really blow up in like oh three oh four. I mean you know for lack of better definition, prog rock was kind of just was not on a main stage anywhere and all of a sudden it's like boom it's there again and you're getting something that's like a weird king crimson santana hybrids on a huge festival stage you would have never seen that in the past 10 20 years right right and i think that's what flips people you know and the other thing that flips people like but they don't really they always seem to miss because we always had really great drummers 
Oh yeah, no kidding. But 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 the the crazy thing is like the, you know these, this is like especially like coming from Omar. Omar is like the the antithesis of a pro guitar player. Like he's the opposite of the guy in Dream Theater or whoever else plays prog, I don't know, but like, you know, he's, punk, he's a punk rock kid who, who fucking comes at you with like just bizarre ideas. And it's not really about, it's not really about playing noty or passage. It's about like, he was just writing stuff that he had never heard. And that happened to be stuff that sounded prog rocky, yeah, yeah. but it wasn't really like so much coming from like, I'm going to try to make a prog that has like odd times, like odd time signatures are just weird. And they're not four four. They're not regular. They're not square. So he would write these things that were in odd time. And so, like, of course, prog people are going to go straight to it. They hear five four, and they're like, "I'm there," you know what <laughs> I mean? But he was just like, "I don't know. This is just what my riff is." You know, my riff is in this weird thing, and he, you know, he couldn't explain it to you. It's not. He's not from that world. Right. So that's what I mean. Like, so then you get this weird hybrid of prog rock, no, and that's why nobody will ever sound like us. Because nobody comes at prog rock or whatever at from that angle. I mean, Black Flag was kind of, you know, Greg Ginn, I think, is kind of weird and proggy in his own way. You know, the Jesus Lizard had progginess to him. You know what I mean? So, I mean, like, it's just they did weird, unconventional shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, and so that's what I mean. Like, you know, I just think there's a lot of... Like misconception, like, you know, I just, I think there's a lot of fans out there that don't understand that background to the band. You know, they're like, they're musoids and they only understand the musical aspect of it because our drummers are great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it makes sense though, because you have, you know, you had Omar and Cedric coming from at the drive in and de facto and all these, right. definitely not. And you weren't coming from anything quote unquote progressive either. I mean, basically everyone who was coming together definitely was not in that background. And it was just kind of like, let's just make some music. Oh, I guess it kind of fits in this. You can label it that, but it's not really that. And it was, it was one of the right. fantastic things exactly. about it is just, and then each album you successfully warmed up a whole new group of fans and then collectively pissed off a whole other bunch because you didn't do the exact same thing. Right, right, right. So, you know, I, I, you know, it, it's one of those things that when I when they, they first asked me to, you know, participate in, or, you know, check out their band or whatever to possibly play bass in it. When I first heard the record, I was just like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is some out there shit. Because, you know, I listen to a lot of music and I was like, this is out there. This is like, yeah, it's a, there's a lot of elements, but it's, it's just like when people hear Santana, they're like, oh, yeah, kind of Santana. Well, that's just because there's a Latin thing in it. It's not particularly from Santana, right, right. it's actually Latin, you know, like, you know, feels or, or riffs or grooves or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. but anyway, it's that. And then it's, you know, it's punk, but then, you know, but I was just, I was blown away with it. And, you know, like every record, like I was just like, you know, you know, it's, and then, you know, then you switch up drummers, which is just a whole nother challenge coming from being a bass player. And you're like, shit, another drummer with a whole new, approach and a weird angle and then, then another drummer and then another drummer. <laughs> like spinal tap. Like, I mean, you know, it, it's just because that that's the hard role to fill. Like yeah. people, I don't know, you know, I just hung out with Abe Laborio Jr. And he was telling me like, well, you know, he's doing those Paul McCartney shows and they're like three hours and, you know, that's with like encores and stuff. I was like, I was thinking at the time, I was like, well, man, Mars Volta, we'd do three hour shows with no encore. It was just we'd walk straight. on, and three hours later we'd walk off. Imagine what that does to a drummer. Like Abe is like, I'll walk off stage and I'm I'm wasted, and rightfully so. It's all drums are physical. Oh yeah, it's a, yep. you know it's like a it's like a sport. And then you you know you you take these other dudes and they're playing three hours with no encore, and it's crazy ass complex music where you're being asked by the band to hit as hard as you can. I mean it's it's just nuts. It's nuts. Was it disappointing, uh, try not to say too much more on Volta, but was it disappointing that you didn't get to do more work with D'Antoni since th after the that last tour and it split? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, D, we tried to get D in 2006. Like, they, you know, once we saw that, that the one drummer wasn't working out, we were like, you know, looking at I, my, it comes back to like Jonathan Hitchke was like, oh, you should check this dude out. I would fucking play this guy on the tour bus when Omar would walk on and hoping that Omar would go. <laughs> and then, of course, one couple of times Omar was like, who is this? And I'm like, this is D, this is D, you know, like we should check him out. 
And then Dee lived in Brooklyn when Omar was living in Brooklyn. And so Dee came through and we hung out with them and played with them. And we were just like, this is the dude. But he was doing other stuff and he just didn't want to join them. So, you know, finally, when he comes back into the band, I was like, oh, this is it. This is, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the guy that couldn't replace the, the, the really replace that, that, that brotherhood that we had with John. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, you know, and then it just didn't last long. Yeah. Like you said, it didn't last long. I, I love D to death. I love John to death. I love John so much. I mean, you know, the other guys were all really great drummers, but you know, those two guys, like they have that other element that it's like that. You just, it's your brotherhood. You're they're, they're, they're so tight with you, you know, and you just make, they have your back kind of thing. You know what I mean? And now he's doing keyboard and drums at the same time. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's, 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 he's pretty phenomenal. There's not too much. I wouldn't, I mean, and his production, I mean, I'm telling you, man, D's production on that he does on his own is amazing. You know, he's a, he's a great producer. He has great ears. He's, you know, he bumps out some wild stuff, yep. you know, we're, we're a lucky band, you know, but also like it comes from doing a lot of research, you know, there's a billion drummers out there, but I'm telling you, we called up almost every one and you know, D was the one we always wanted. So <laughs> imagine that, you know what I mean? Like after John, D was like, but uh, we called a ton of dudes. He, he was the white whale. <laughs> um, just a couple more questions. Number one, uh, Zavala's what's, what's going on there? I have no idea. No. I, I really don't. Um, you know, because, you know, what happened was like we were making this record and, and in the midst of making the record, you know, I was working with Deltron, but, you know, it, I did my best and I felt I did a really good job of not letting it compromise what Zavala was trying to do. And then after we recorded the last thing we did and we were super excited, we got it mixed by Dave Fridman. He did an awesome job. We were just so stoked. And then Broken Bells called up Dan, our guitar player, and he's touring with them right now. And that kind of put a lot of pressure on the entire situation. And and then Cedric, you know, he's he's got a family and he has to make money too. And so he's doing what he has to do to make money. And I I I, I would love nothing more for that record to come out. I mean, you have no idea. I don't like making beautiful pieces of, of work and have it not come out. That, that, that's harder to accept than anything for an artist, I think. And I hope it comes out, but I, it's up to him and, and his schedule and, you know, where he's at. Cause he's doing, I mean, I know he, lo- I know he loves it. I know he loves that record, mm-hmm. but I, I, I just don't know. You know, he's got to also do what he's committed to doing right now too. Yeah. Cause he's doing a uh, anti-mask now with Dave and Omar. Right. Exactly. Have you listened to any of those tracks? No, I haven't actually. Um, just not really because I, I, you know, I'm I'm not into it or anything. It's just like I don't know. Like I'm not into listening to rock music right now. Sure, sure. So I I you know like you jump like I'm, when you're surrounded by hip hop, that's kind of all I listen to. I mean, it's kind of what I always just pretty really much listen to, and rock is always secondary. But but I I just listen to a lot of hip hop right now. I mean, I do like the Horrors new record, but that's just because I love that band so much. Mm-hmm. And so that's probably the only rock record I've actually listened to this year. And so I don't know. I'm just not compelled to listen to rock music. Okay. And I really, really like, you know, I can, I can tell you what the new John Wayne record sounds like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, or, or something like that, but like Kanye record, or I don't even know. I, I just, I turn on power one of six and listen to that, or I turn on K day and listen to that or, or whatever, you know, whatever anybody at Deltron is listening to. So Yeah, what uh for people listening, what hip hop artists would you recommend that are maybe a little bit under the current? Oh, John Wayne. I mean and how do you he's, spell he's that? Kinda not a, he's John J O N Wayne, W A Y N E John Wayne. He's on Stone's Throw. Okay. His uh, his record is awesome. Just awesome. I love Kendrick Lamar. He's not he's obviously giant. I love Kendrick though. I love Absol. Um he's kind of in the Kendrick camp, I guess. I think he's tight. I'm not a big fan of Odd Future, though I, I think Earl's really talented. I think he's a really, he has good flow. I think everything Dell does, because like, I just like, I knew of Dell and I had a couple, like I had the Dell Tron record and another Dell record, but you know, now playing with him, man, I, I think people need to go through his catalog. They, that dude is, nobody's like him. No one. I, you know, again, like 
I'm just fortunate to play around dudes who are only sound like who they are. Right. Nobody sounds like Koala. No production sounds like Automators. And nobody sounds like Dell. And so you want to hear original rap style with insane flows and switch up to shit Dell. He's awesome. I've been listening to a lot of that. Um, and, I, you know, I think, I think uh, I mean, I love James Blake, but I'm not really hip hop, but uh-huh. I just, I love that dude, man. That that dude. I'm, I mean, it's like there's like a few, very few artists that I look forward to their next release, and his I look forward to. I mean, look at the Horrors record. I I waited to buy that record in Japan because I knew I was going to get extra bonus tracks because they always do that in Japan. Yeah, they do. That's how much I that's how much I love the Horrors. So. Yeah. Well, as we're wrapping up, uh, for the couple interviews we've done, we usually have about four stock questions we like to ask because why not? Cool. Uh, first of all, yeah. if you're to describe your sound or yourself in one tweet, how would you do it? Oh, gee. <laughs> if you were to cover one song, what song would you like to cover? Fuck. Uh, shit. Anything off the Band of Gypsies record. Oh, okay. And for sure. And if you were to, if one artist or band were to cover something you've been on, what would that be? What would I want them to cover? Yeah, so you could hear someone else's interpretation of your work. Oh, all right, all right, yeah, go for it. Go cover Scarified. Okay. That's a racer ass song. <laughs> you probably not. Go, 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 go YouTube it. But like, Scarified is like one of the hardest. It's like any guy who gets into shred guitar, <laughs> like, he eventually finds Racer X and eventually has to learn Scarified. And so it's an insanely difficult song to play. And I played it on bass while these guys played it on guitar. So it's really hard on bass. And so I always tell them, yeah, go learn Scarified. <laughs> so you, you just like to hear someone pull hard. that. You just like to hear somebody pull that off. Yeah, like, can you pull that thing off, man? Because that ain't easy. Oh. <laughs> Even the solo. And there's bass solo breaks in there that aren't easy. And there's a two handed bass part that difficult so like like yeah it's the hardest thing i've ever had i I spent six months of my life practicing only that so i know how hard it is and finally what is the perfect sandwich my wife's tuna sandwich i mean she she makes an awesome tuna sandwich because she uses cutie mayonnaise which is japanese mayonnaise but she, she my wife makes unbelievable sandwiches she is she has that art down like it doesn't break when you bite into it it doesn't rip up your mouth but it's always the best sandwich so yes my wife's tuna sandwich all right well there you have it uh juan thank you so much for talking to riff and rock music talk it was an absolute pleasure all right thank you man appreciate it all right bye